All right. Well, thank you, uh, Derek, for that introduction. Again, I'm Eric Hansen. Uh, I've been on faculty at UCSF since uh, 2012, and I currently serve as the uh, chief of uh, the division of arthroplasty. I also want to acknowledge the organizers of the COA meeting for allowing me to present this morning. I'm going to be taking you through tips and tricks on total knee arthroplasty, and I'm going to try to keep this as practical and clinically relevant as possible. Um, so by way of disclosures, um, I do have a product development agreement with Corin uh, on their Omnibot platform, but that won't be relevant for today's discussion. So the goal of this talk really is to provide you with tips on ways to stay out of trouble. As Warren Buffett said, it's much easier to stay out of trouble now than to get out of it later. So I could uh, provide you some thoughts on all of the aspects of the perioperative um, pathway, but I'm gonna focus my comments specifically on the pre-op and intra-op considerations. And if there's time uh, left during q and I'm happy to share my thoughts on the post-op uh, uh, pathway. So starting with the preoperative evaluation of the patient with knee arthritis. One of the first things to assess during the clinical exam is the coronal deformity of the patient and to determine if it is correctable to neutral. If it's not, then you should be prepared to do more soft tissue releases to balance the knee. Additionally, you should examine the chloral ligament competency at zero and 30 degrees. And if there's significant laxity, anticipate the need for a higher level of constraint at the time of surgery. In the sagittal plane, a fixed flexion contracture should key you in to being prepared to make a larger distal femoral resection, as well as the need to remove posterior osteophytes and perform an aggressive posterior capsular release. Conversely, with the recurvatum, one has to be mindful of the extension gap and be conservative with that initial distal femoral resection. And in cases of polio plus recurvatum, a primary hinge knee replacement should be considered. While quad weakness is probably the most common cause of extensor lag, the etiologies are multiple and the reasons should be further worked up before entertaining surgery. Regarding stiffness, I think it's important to counsel patients that the best predictor of post-op range of motion is the motion they enter surgery with so that the goals and expectations of patient and physician are reasonably aligned. As for incisions, I always tell patients that they're gonna experience numbness on the lateral aspect given the sensory innervation to the anterior skin. While it's important to respect the more tenuous vascular supply to the knee's overlying skin, most incisions can be incorporated or avoided. Transverse incisions can be crossed perpendicularly and when multiple longitudinal incisions exist on the knee, the lateral one is the safest to use. So now moving on uh, to some red flags you may see on the x-rays of your uh, clinic patients. Obviously, these knee x-rays don't indicate isolated unicompartmental lateral knee arthritis, but rather degrees of MCL incompetence. And the question is really, what level of constraint will be necessary at the time of the total knee replacement? For this one, we could get by probably with a semi-constrained implant and note the cemented stems to uh, buffer or so bolster the fixation. Whereas this one, not surprisingly, required a primary hinge total knee replacement. Scrutinizing the lateral x-ray for patella baja, especially in cases where patients have evidence of prior BTB ACL reconstructions, AT HTOs, or other periarticular knee surgeries is important. As I know, this will be a more difficult surgical exposure and may adversely affect patella tracking. In these cases, I take my time removing the infrapatellar scar tissue right after the arthrotomy. At times, I perform my patellar resection right off the bat, and I'm very mindful not to raise the joint line, which can exacerbate the problem. While it's not uncommon to see some patellar tilt or subluxation in a valgus deformity, when I see it in a varus knee, it likely indicates inherent lateral retinacular tightness which makes me more inclined to perform a release at the conclusion of the case, as long as I've done everything up to that point to optimize the Q angle, specifically avoiding internal rotation of the components, lateralizing my femoral component and medializing my patellar button. 
with a very thin patella, as pictured here, you have to make the decision about whether to resurface or not. Most consider 12 millimeters, the lower border of safe remnant bone, so as to avoid a patella fracture. One option in this situation would be to do a trabecular metal convex patella. Alternatively, you could perform a patelloplasty in these cases as long as the postoperative tracking is reasonable. For bony malunions of the femur or tibia, you have to decide whether it will be possible to correct the alignment through the joint or whether a corrective osteotomy will be needed, either as a stage procedure or at the time of the total knee replacement. My general rule of thumb is to draw out my proximal tibial and distal femoral resection osteotomies on the scanogram. And if the line violates either the origin or the insertion of the collateral ligaments, then an osteotomy is needed, which fortunately happens to be very rare. With retained hardware, it's important to determine whether you need to remove it at all. And if so, how much? Often, only certain elements of the construct will truly get in the way of your arthroplasty prosthesis. But you also need to be ready to use alternate strategies to the femoral intramedullary cutting guide and recognize the implications on ligamentous stability from these prior injuries and surgeries. With patients with ghost bone like this, I would say that cemented knee arthroplasty is the best mode of fixation and consideration should be given to adding short cemented stems. During these operations, I'm especially vigilant with the resident's handling of retractors, saws, impactors, and even pulse lavage, as I've seen pressurized saline damage the bone in these very osteoporotic patients. Seeing a next knee x-ray like this is pathognomonic for Charcot arthropathy and should be approached with extreme caution. It's important to confirm that these patients don't have uncontrolled diabetes, an unrecognized myelopathic spine, and if you're brave and or crazy enough to do this total knee, this is an indication for a primary hinge. So now I'm going to move on to some intraoperative pearls. As mentioned earlier, you want to use the most lateral prior vertical incision because of the medial-based blood supply to the anterior skin. While the textbooks often suggest a five to six centimeter skin bridge, this may not always be possible. That being said, attempts should be made to avoid acute angles between incisions. And after the skin incision, full thickness flaps should be elevated. My residents all know one of my mantras is no fat left behind. And this is to, to avoid disrupting the rich network of anastomoses in the subcutaneous fat. My surgical workflow is femur first. The entry point to the opening drill is classically described as just anterior to the PCL origin, but I will often modify that slightly based on the scanogram and where the anatomic axis line exits the distal femur. It's important to then over drill or expand the initial pilot hole shown here in green. One, it ensures the IM guide is truly referencing the endosteal canal and not being misdirected by a tight opening hole. It then allows me to also irrigate and evacuate some bone marrow to avoid causing a storm of fat emboli when the IM rod is placed in the canal. In most cases, the guide is set between five to seven degrees of valgus, which can be personalized for the patient if you get pre-op scanograms, though clinically there hasn't been shown to be any clinical benefit to this approach. It's very important at this stage to place Homans or Z-retractors between the femur and the collateral ligaments to avoid iatrogenic injury. I teach my residents to always start cutting the less sclerotic side first to avoid skiving and creating a non-flat flat surface. And in general, before I actually make this distal femoral cut, I place an angel wing through the slot, ensuring it exits right at the sulcus indicated by the diagram above for an appropriate resection depth. Based on the degree of afflection contracture present, one can consider cutting extra distal femur, recognizing that Raising the joint line can create mid-flexion instability and patellar issues. In cases where an IM guide isn't feasible, such as femoral hardware or malunions as alluded to before, multiple technologic solutions currently exist. A handheld accelerometer is shown here. You have the option of custom cutting blocks, traditional pin array navigation, and more popularly now, robots and for historical purpose, extramedullary alignment. I use a traditional measured resection technique, and therefore I have my trainees 
draw out Whiteside's line and the TEA before putting on the femoral rotation and sizing guide. Given that these lines should be perpendicular to one another, if the TE line they draw appears internally rotated, I just made sure that the uh, rotation guide is externally rotated to their reference mark uh, before pinning it. In bad knees with valgus, uh, a lateral, uh, bad valgus knees with lateral condylar hyperplasia, the drawing of the axes is all the more important to me as the standard three degrees of external rotation from the posterior condylar axis may still leave the patient in some degree of internal rotation. When sizing the femur, always reference the anterolateral femur. Ensure there's no interposed synovium, giving a false measurement. If you're in between sizes, start with the larger one as you can always downsize and cut more bone. You can't give it back. It's also important to note how your TK system uh, grows between sizes. The one I use grows three millimeters between sizes. Therefore, if I've cut the larger size and I'm concerned about some medial lateral overhang, if I estimate that I can get away with another three millimeters of resection, I will cut for the size down. Having made the cut, inspect the bone. This grand piano sign is a proxy for appropriate femoral rotation as the anterior lateral bone sits higher. If on the other hand, you end up with an anterior bone resection that looks more like a symmetric hill, you've likely internally rotated your cut. Conversely, if you've overly externally rotated your guide, you will see a very exaggerated grand piano sign. To prevent notching, start your cut anteromedially as it isn't as deep a cut and you can anticipate what will ultimately happen anterolaterally. Also, if you are notching, just stop short where you anticipate the proximal aspect of the femoral component will sit. You don't want to keep blindly plunging further up the femur and make things worse. You can always use a burr or runger to smooth out the notch for better aesthetics on your post-operative x-rays. And if you notch, it isn't the end of the world. I've notched many femurs in my day and I've taken care of a number of periprosthetic distal femur fractures and I haven't seen that association once. For the proximal tibia cut, my classic teaching is measure thrice cut once. And what I mean by that is you have to first check your coronal and sagittal alignment of the cutting block and your depth of resection before pinning it. Once you've made the cut, then it's important that you do the double check of not only inspecting your bony resection waiver, but also using a drop rod to check alignment. To set the coronal alignment of the tibia, you want to first draw an AP axis right down the tibial spines. And the reason is that you don't want to uh, create uh, a varus or valgus resection uh, by the slope that is uh, cut into your proximal tibia. Then I palpate the distal tibia and ensure that the shadow created by my headlight uh, and the vertical bar of the extramedullary guide are collinear. For the sagittal alignment, my first step is to look at the lateral x-ray hanging in the room to assess the patient's native slope. Then you have to determine the goal for your TKA, which will differ if you retain or resect your PCL. With CR knees, it's re recommended to cut some slope to assist with femoral rollback, while PS knees aim for neutral slope to avoid increasing the flexion gap. I caution people who use the three two finger technique under the bar to assess slope because the body habitus can really throw off the accuracy of this assessment. I prefer to eyeball the relationship of the lateral plateau to the cutting guide or actually swoosh it. Regarding the depth of resection using the 2-9 stylus, for regular varus knees, I will reference nine millimeters off the unaffected lateral side to ensure I have enough space for the smallest composite tibial uh, component with poly. For standard valgus knees, I will often float the nine millimeter finger off the less affected medial side. As any more than that, you'll be chasing the gaps for the remainder of the case and likely end up with a very thick poly. In severe deformities, I will consider cutting two millimeters off the affected side, but more often than not, I'll often stop short of cutting to the bottom of the deformity to avoid removing too much bone on the less affected side. This unresurfaced bone can be addressed by burring the sclerotic bone or using a screw and rebar technique if needed. So after measuring thrice and cutting once, then I'll do the double check, which consists of looking at the resected bone from the front and the side and confirming that it's consistent with my preoperative plan. Then you can use a drop rod to see you've achieved your coronal and sagittal goals.
If you've inadvertently cut the tibia in varus, the drop rod will head towards the lateral malleolus. And conversely, if you've cut it in valgus, the drop rod heads medially. This can be corroborated by the bone wafer you removed and identifying a deeper cut on the medial or lateral side respectively than what you planned. Next, you can check your flexion extension gaps with one of these spacer blocks with the goal of obtaining symmetric rectangular gaps that accommodate at least the smallest composite thickness of your system. While our goal is a rectangular gap, what if you get a trapezoidal gap? What does that in imply? Well, I simply put, I think of it in terms of bony issues, either the femur or the tibia or soft tissue issues, whether due to the patient's preoperative de de deformity or an iatrogenic injury. So let's take an example of a trapezoidal flexion gap with a larger medial gap than the lateral one. So if you think about the femur, did you overly externally rotate it and see that exaggerated grand piano sign? Did you cut the tibia and varus? And do you see that the drop rod fell laterally? In terms of preoperative deformity, was this a valgus knee and something we might expect to see? If it was a varus knee and you saw this asymmetric flexion gap, then potentially the anterior MCL has been disrupted. The same line of thinking can be applied to a trapezoidal flexion gap with the lateral side larger than the medial. Was the femur cut in internal rotation? And I saw that symmetric hill of an anterior femoral cut. Was the tibia cut in valgus? And I noticed too thick of a lateral resection on my bone wafer. Was a patient a severe varus knee? And this is part of their uh, underlying uh, pathology. Or did I inadvertently cut the popliteus during the procedure? Most of us are probably using a periarticular injection these days as part of our multimodal pain protocol. We use the Delury or RET cocktail, which consists of ropivacaine, epinephrine, clonidine, and ketorolac that the pharmacist premix for us in a, into a 100 cc solution. It's important to inject the periosteum because of that rich innervation. And while it makes sense to inject the posterior capsule because the adductor single shot covers most of the anterior knee, we at UCSF have definitely had some transient nerve palsies from spread of the injection to the tibial or perineal nerve. While these will routinely resolve within 24 hours, it does somewhat delay uh, uh, therapy on, on the day of surgery. And while some of my partners inject throughout the procedure, I usually take advantage of the downtime when the cement is curing. Regarding patella resurfacing, the goal is to restore the composite thickness of the patella. So I initially, if I initially measure the host bone to be 24 millimeters with the caliper, and I know my button is nine millimeters thick, then I'm shooting for a 15 millimeter residual patella. And whether you use a guide or a freehand technique, the goal is a symmetric resection. And this can be confirmed when clamping the trial to see if the surfaces of the patella, the button, and the clamp squeezer are all parallel. When sizing the patella, you wanna use the largest one that fits the bone without overhanging. And for patellar tracking, it's ideal to medialize it. This may leave some exposed lateral facet which I will routinely remove with a burr and ronger as this exposed bone, if it impinges on the femoral component, can be a source of post-operative pain. If the patella tracks laterally after all your components are in, double check your component position and rotation. Check your pre-op x-rays for a pre-existing tilt or subluxation. Drop the tourniquet and check again. And if it's mild, place a towel clip on the arthrotomy and check once more to see if that corrects it. While lateral release is a powerful technique to help centralize the tracking, I found that patients don't like the postoperative bulge they see laterally on their knee. And I've got a good number of patients with some patellar tilt on their follow-up x-rays who are super happy with great range of motion. And therefore it's extremely rare for me to perform a lateral re release in the primary setting. Few words on cementing. You want clean, dry, bony surfaces. And if you hadn't inflated the, the tourniquet yet, this is the time to do so. You wanna finger pressurize the cement into the bone and blot away all fat and blood from the cement. Then coat your implants as this will improve the cement implant bond. Make sure to place a little on the posterior condyles of the femoral component, as this will obviate the need to put any on the bony posterior femoral condyles, which would other potentially result in excess cement extruding in the back of the knee. Closure should be meticulous and multi-layered. I tend to use a combination of interrupted and running barbed suture for the arthrotomy for aesthetic reasons and to avoid an extra visit to the office for suture or staple removal. I've moved to a subcuticular closure 
which has been a game changer. And it's important to remember to place the dressing on in hyperflexion with very little tension placed on the steri strips or tegaderms to avoid blistering. Thank you very much. Eric, that was an awesome tour of uh, pretty much everything that I do in total joint arthroplasty, especially about the knee right now. Uh, could you comment really uh, on the grand piano sign uh, again? I think that's one of the rotation is one of kind of the hidden portions of total knee. So comment what you're looking for there. I also look for the kind of anterior flat part of the femur. There's a flat portion on the anterior femur to match the transverse epicondylar axis. So can comment again on your rotation specifically, uh, and then maybe we'll get into a couple of questions uh, that, that I have on terms of maybe cone use and things like that. So let's do a couple of questions here, pull out some of the chat, and then we'll move on to Gavin's talk. So, sorry, my block here, can you hear me? Okay, so in terms of uh, that grand piano sign, yeah, I mean, I showed you through three sort of variations on that anterior femoral resection. The grand piano sign truly does look like the top of a grand piano. Um, and so that's kind of what uh, I'm looking for in the standard knee. There are clearly people who've got weird trochlear um, uh, hypoplasia, some dysmorphic femurs where that won't necessarily be the case. So you got to take a lot of uh, factors into consideration. Um, but when I do see, rather than the grand piano, that more symmetric hump of, uh, of an anterior cut, then I'm a little bit uh, worried that uh, potentially we've uh, internally rotated that uh, component or the, the cutting block. And that often happens potentially if they have uh, a lot of healthy medial uh, cartilage on the posterior femurs. And so it's going to artificially internally rotate that uh, uh, posterior referenced uh, guide. Yeah, so I think one of the keys here is you're aware of when you're going to deviate your rotation. The, the other time you get internal rotation and see that funny grand piano is the valgus knee as well. It can be a little bit uh, of a driver if you're not paying attention to it. Um, you brought up the issues of utilizing hinges. Have, and so people don't really talk about primary cones. Would you utilize a cone with your hinge to create durability? Uh, that'd be one question I have, and then maybe we can end the questions here with, where do you see the use of technology, particularly some of the alignment related things, navigation, robotics, and cutting guides, where would you choose to really use them as opposed to maybe use them for wanting or other issues, marketing and other issues? Yeah, no, so some so, and interesting ideas. So in terms of a primary hinge, that's going to be a, a, a pretty rare bird. Um, and I think cones and sleeves were initially designed uh, really for metaphyseal uh, bone loss in the revision setting. Um, but I think a lot of surgeons are now using uh, it as a, a means of, of getting a better durable fixation of their cement. And so in, in an, a knee that you're anticip anticipating, a lot of sort of uh, implant uh, cement and cement bone stresses uh, due to the level of constraint. And I think uh, I would definitely go with a, a, a cone uh, in, in a primary hinge uh, setting. As for your question about technology, obviously we can't, can't completely slow the train. Uh, this technology train is moving forward. You don't wanna be the first one on it. You don't wanna be the last one on it. So uh, I think the thoughtful adoption of technology is, is really important. Uh, we were fortunate to have Bob, Rob Truesdale come and give us uh, grand rounds this past week, and he presented the Mayo experience on uh, their 20-year uh, outcomes of looking at uh, coronal alignment uh, in knees, uh, outliers being greater than three degrees from the mechanical axis, and found no difference in survivorship nor in uh, knee outcome score. So Again, these technologies can make us more precise in hitting our targets, but do we know the exact target? I would say currently we don't know the target that we're shooting for. I think it's not just alignment and bony cuts. I think there is something uh, that has to be said about soft tissue balancing and technologies that allow us to uh, uh, achieve that uh, more reliably, uh, I think uh, may help us um, and uh, you know, remain, remains to be seen, but those are my thoughts. No, I agree. I agree with you completely uh, with respect to the train that's coming. And, and maybe it gives us a little bit better window into the soft tissue envelope that you uh, 
um, and a more precise way to manage gaps that uh, we kind of worry about in this setting. The, the one place I do see this very useful utilization of technology is in the intersection with hardware and deformity. So it can be quite useful uh, when we do conventional arthroplasty, we register the anatomic axis, but and we can never really see the mechanical axis. We guess where it is. And Eric made some great points about start site and management of that uh, anatomic axis. But when the anatomic axis is not attainable in surgery with femoral hardware or tibial hardware or the deformity or a fracture union, uh, that can be a great place to apply these assistive technologies hasn't been directly studied, but probably is a big payoff in terms of uh, the removal of hardware consequences, et cetera. There was one other question posted about MCL uh, deficiency. So when you do have an MCL deficiency in a primary knee, uh, you showed that you would be, have no hesitation to go to constraint or a hinge, but what that occurs in your primary knee in the middle of the case, how, how are you gonna handle that? So uh, MCL uh, injuries uh, have different flavors. Um, there are the MCL injuries that are, are kind of in uh, avulsions uh, off and off of the insertion on the tibia. I've had that occur and they're usually partial. Um, it could be the anterior fibers. And so the flexion gap looks a little trapezoidal. Uh, in those cases, um, I will often still go to a higher level of constraint and, um, you know, the system that I had been using allows a pretty easy switch from a PS to a TS. Um, I don't go chasing that by then loosening up the lateral side and then, then you're going to get a, a big flexion compared to an extension gap. So I just recognize it. I put a, a higher level of constraint. There are the ones where you cut through the mid substance with a saw. That's a different beast. And so I think uh, you should try everything you can to, to directly repair that. Probably still needs a, a higher level of constraint, whether a full hinge or a semi constraint. Uh, and I would protect that uh, even so uh, with a, a hinge knee brace. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. These in general probably are not best handled with reconstruction could be handled with primary repair of mid-substance, and constraint is probably the major driver of our treatment here. Um, I, I too have had those, uh, all those things occur, and I agree with exactly what you said.